हेलो गाइस हाउ आर यू आई एम हरदीप सिंह वेलकम बैक टू योर ओन यूट्यूब चैनल आल्स अपडेट्स एंड रीसेंट एग्जाम्स फॉर मोर अपडेट्स रिलेटेड टू रीसेंट आल्स एग्जाम राइटिंग दस टॉपिक्स लिस्टिंग रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट एंड स्पीकिंग क्यू कैट गेस्ट वर्क प्लीज गाइस पार्टिसिपेट इन एवरी डे लिस्टिंग एंड रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट टू अचीव योर डिजायर बैंड स्कोर इन योर एक्चुअल आल्स एग्जाम Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page Alts updates and recent exams. Part 1. You'll hear a telephone conversation. Now you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Good morning, Country Comfort Albury. Oh, hi. I'd like some information, please. I'd like to find a double room to stay for the weekend. What kind of rooms do you have? Well, we provide a variety range of accommodation depending upon your likes. The guest house room costs forty-five dollars per night. It provides air conditioning and shower, and a waterfront room costs eighty dollars per night. It has got its own balcony overlooking the foreshore of the lake. And we've got a kid. How do you charge for children? Extra bedding is available if you require that. If the kid is aged twelve and below, the cost is ten dollars per night for the guest house room and fifteen dollars for the waterfront room. Do you have a swimming pool, tennis court, or something like that? Yes, we've got a swimming pool, which is free for all the guests. But the tennis court charges eight dollars each hour, including the rent of rackets. How about other facilities? We provide free off-street car parking and internet access. We also installed in-house movies, but that costs four dollars per hour. Oh, we don't think we need that because of the kid, you know. We don't want him to see movies on the weekend. Well, we also offer ironing equipment in the room. That's useful, I think. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to go through the questions seven to ten. Great. Could you tell me the address? How do we get there? Yes, it's Country Comfort Albury, A L B U R Y, at six hundred and forty-eight Dean Street, New South Wales. Six four eight Dean Street, D E A N. Is that right? Yes. Well, I wonder what activities are available there in this season. You know, we want to have an indulgent weekend in the boring winter. Oh, you'll not get bored here. You know. Albury is the perfect base for alpine skiing. Besides that, winter's frosty alpine air encourages walks through mist-laden valleys. You can walk alongside rushing streams and waterfalls. After returning to the warm and comfortable lounge, you can sit by the open fire. I think this is the ideal time of year to nourish your body at the Salus Spa. The idea of skiing doesn't appeal to me very much. But it sounds good to have a relaxing walk through the valleys. Maybe after that, I'll have a massage and some soaking in the spa. And you know, this hotel is perfectly located in a quiet position off the main highway in central Albury. It's within walking distance of licensed clubs, restaurants, shops, and the central business district. It's known for its excellent cuisine and warm Australian hospitality. Good. It's a good idea to taste the tasty dishes in one of the restaurants. My wife may be interested in shopping. She's always keen on that. I think I'll contact you later. Thank you very much. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute 
to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear two students discussing a project they have to do as part of a literature course on great books. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Hi, Joey. How are you doing? I heard you were sick. Oh, hi, Olivia. Yeah, I had a virus last week, and I missed a whole pile of lectures, like the first one on the great books in literature, where Dr. Castle gave us all the information about the semester project. I can give you copies of the handouts. I've got them right here. But that's okay. I already collected the handouts, but I'm not very clear about all the details. I know we each have to choose an individual author, I think I'm going to do Carlos Castaneda. I'm really interested in South American literature. Have you checked he's on the list that Dr. Castle gave us? We can't just choose anyone. Yeah, I checked. It's okay. Who did you choose? Well, I was thinking of choosing Ernest Hemingway, but then I thought, no, I'll do a British author, not an American one. So I chose Emily Bronte. Okay. And first of all, it says we have to read a biography of our author. I guess it's okay if we just look up information about him on the internet? No, it's got to be a full-length book. I think the minimum length's 250 pages. There's a list of biographies. Didn't you get that? Oh, right. I didn't realize we had to stick with that. So, what do we have to do when we've read the biography? Well, then we have to choose one work by the writer. Again, it's got to be something quite long. We can't just read a short story. But I guess a collection of short stories would be okay? Yes, or even a collection of poems, they said. But I think most people are doing novels. I'm going to do Wuthering Heights. I've read it before, but I really want to read it again now I've found out more about the writer. And then the video. We have to make a short video about our author and about the book. How long has it got to be? A minute. What? Like 60 seconds? we got to give all the important information about their life and the book we choose? Well, you can't do everything. I wrote it down somewhere. Yes, Dr. Castle said we had to find or write a short passage that helps to explain the author's passion for writing, why they're a writer. So we can back this up with reference to important events in the writer's life, if they're relevant. But it's up to us, really. The video's meant to portray the essence of the writer's life and the piece of writing we choose. So, when we read the biography, we have to think about what kind of person our writer is. Yes, and the historical context and so on. So, for my writer, Emily Bronte, the biography gave a really strong impression of the place where she lived and the countryside around. Right. I'm beginning to get the idea. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Uh, can I check the other requirements with you? Sure. The handout said after we'd read the biography, we had to read the work we'd chosen by our author and choose a passage that's typical in some way, that typifies the author's interests and style. 
Yes, but at the same time, it has to relate to the biographical extract you choose. There's got to be some sort of theme linking them. Okay, I'm with you. And then you have to think about the video. So are we meant to dramatize the scene we choose? I guess we could, but there's not a lot of time for that. I think it's more how we can use things like sound effects to create the atmosphere, the feeling we want. And presumably visuals as well? Yeah, of course. I mean, I suppose that's the whole point of making a video. But whatever we use has to be historically in keeping with the author. We can use things like digital image processing to do it all. So we can use any computer software we want? Sure. And it's important that we use a range, not just one software program. That's actually one of the things we're assessed on. Okay. Oh, and something else that's apparently really important is to keep track of the materials we use and to acknowledge them. Including stuff we download off the internet, presumably? Yeah, so our video has to list all the material used with details of the source in a bibliography at the end. Okay, and you were talking about assessment of the project. Did they give us the criteria? I couldn't find anything on the handout. Sure. He gave us them in the lecture. Let's see, you get 25% just for getting all the components done. That's both sets of reading and the video. Then the second part is actually how successful we are at getting the essence of the work. They call that content, and that counts for 50%. Then the last 25% is on the video itself, the artistic and technical side. Great. Well, that sounds a lot of work, but a whole lot better than just handing in a paper. But thanks a lot, Olivia. You're welcome. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear a discussion between a student, Aldo, and his supervisor, Dr. Hurst, about his research assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Aldo, how's it going so far with your assignment? Not too bad. You're looking at the community around here. That's right. How people perceive the community they are in. Have you made much progress? Hmm. I conducted quite a lot of interviews on the street with local residents. Their responses are interesting. I haven't got quite as many yet as I'd like. I had wondered if I'd have language problems, particularly with the different accents. I seem to have managed, though. Having to work in the open has made it harder, and with the cold weather there's been recently, people don't necessarily want to stop and talk, like they do if it's nice and sunny. That's something I've had to deal with. Of course, some people are too busy to stop and talk, but that's OK. I see. So, have you formed a good overall picture of how people view the community? To an extent. I've certainly talked to plenty of older people. I guess they may have more time to talk. I still don't really have enough young mothers, though. I've managed to get enough older mothers and children through the schools. That's something I had been worried about. Well, that shouldn't be too hard. Now, how are you going to deal with all the data you've collected? That's the difficult part. I guess I need to run some analyses, but I'm rather unclear about what methods to use. You've told me you're confident about using computers, so... You just need some input on choosing programmes. You should attend a statistics seminar. They're held every Friday 
after the methodology seminars in room 105. That should help you to select an approach. Oh, good. I'll do that. Now you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Meanwhile, let's hear something about what you've learned. Yes, I talked to a number of residents. Good. I imagine they didn't always have the same opinions. Views were certainly quite mixed. Take sports facilities. In general, people seemed to think they weren't very good. There's no swimming pool in the area, for example. But at the same time, there's a new football training area. It looks very smart to me, but it doesn't seem to get used very much. People seem to prefer sitting around in the parks. They enjoy that, taking picnics and so on. Although they want the council to be more efficient at cleaning, there's a lot of litter. People are obviously very concerned about their children's learning. The general view seems to be that early schooling at primary level is of a good standard in the area, but that this standard declines as children move up through the system. The colleges were criticised in particular. OK. Now, are you going to collect any more data? Some, I hope. There's a local festival next week, and I think the events there will give me some useful opportunities. I talked to a council officer about it all. Good. What does it involve? First, there's a dance show, which I'm sure I'll enjoy. The council explained that the concert hall's being renovated and won't be ready in time, so it's being held in the main square which I think will be better anyway. At least I'll have more space to wander around in. True. And so I hope to be able to carefully watch the age groups that are there in the audience and make notes about how they interact. So that's one event. Then, the following day, there's another interesting event which I look forward to going along to, and that's a cookery competition. Oh, yes. Interesting. I think so. Yes, that one's being organised in the town hall which has a big space, apparently. With food and cooking from all the different people in the area, the council officer told me that it'll be a good chance to find out about the different cultures that make up the community. Sounds promising. Then there's one more event I'd like to go along to. The council officer promised me that the courses fair will be interesting. It's going to be in the Langtree Theatre, and the officer said lots of teachers will be there. I've already talked to plenty of them, but he advised me to put some questions to the head of education, who will also be there. That's all very useful. OK, I suggest you come back next... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear a historian giving a presentation about techniques to identify the origin of handwritten books from the Middle Ages. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. My presentation today is on how the science of genetics is being used to shed light on the origin of manuscripts, anything written by hand, produced in the medieval period, that is, the period between the 5th and 15th centuries AD. As many of you know, 
thousands of medieval handwritten books still exist today. Some of them have a clear provenance, that is, we know exactly where and when they were written. But the origin of many manuscripts has been a complete mystery, that is, until 2009, when geneticists started using DNA testing to shed light on their origins. But before looking at the new research, I need to explain something about the way the manuscripts were produced, particularly what they were written on. Virtually all were written on treated animal skins, and there were essentially two types. The first was parchment, which is made of sheepskin. It has the quality of being very white, but also being thin. It has a naturally greasy surface, which meant it was hard to erase writing from it. This made it much sought after for court documents in medieval times. The second type is vellum, which is calfskin. This was most often used for any very high-status documents because it provided the best writing surface, so scribes could achieve lettering of high quality. So, once the animal hides had been chosen, they had to be prepared. Where the right materials were on hand, the skins were put into large barrels or vats of lime, where they were agitated or stirred frequently. But if lime wasn't available, then the hides were buried. Both these techniques were designed to cause the hair to slough off and the skins to become gelatinous and therefore more flexible. The next stage was to put the hides on stretcher frames and pull them very tight. While on the frame, they were scraped with a moon-shaped knife in order to create a uniform thickness. For parchment, that was the end of the process. But for vellum, there was an additional stage where it was bleached in order to achieve the desired color. So, what does all this preparation mean for the quest to identify the origins of mystery manuscripts? Well, until recently, the only way historians and other academics were able to guess at origins was either through the analysis of the handwriting style or from the dialect in which the piece was written. But these techniques have proven unreliable for a number of reasons. It was thus decided to try to look at the problem from a different angle, to start from what is known, that is, the small number of manuscripts whose origins we do already know. Because these parchments and vellum are both made from animal hides, it was possible to subject them to DNA testing and to identify the genetic markers for the date and location of production. From this was created what is known as a baseline. The next stage was to test the mystery manuscripts, finding their DNA characteristics, and then making comparisons between the known and the mystery scripts. Genetic similarities and differences enabled the scientists to gain more information about the origins of the many manuscripts we had known virtually nothing about up to that point. Now you might ask, what are the potential uses of this new information? Well, obviously, it can shed light on the origin of individual books and manuscripts. But that's not all. It can also shed light on the evolution of the whole of the manuscript production industry in medieval times. And because that was such a thriving business, involving very large-scale movements right across the globe, the new data in turn help historians establish which trade routes were in operation during the whole millennium. Now, if anyone has any questions... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test, and speaking. You got guesswork. Please, guys, participate in every day new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material, visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com. The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material, then please join my Telegram channel. So guys, please write your score below the comment section.
again thanks for listening god bless you all guys stay tuned stay safe